got out, I saw an opportunity to become involved in this technology and have enjoyed it. I was a, uh, an engineering consulting contractor for uh, about 20 years. And in about 2009, um, when this technology started to take off federally, I was, uh, I was invited by McGraw-Hill to write our first textbook. And together with a wonderful co-writer, Brian Howard Clark, uh, we wrote that first textbook. And then in 2013, we wrote another graduate level textbook, which we'll cover a little bit uh, in a little while. Since then, I be, since the writing of those textbooks, I've been privileged to work with a, a great many um, uh, wonderful people in the industry and our, and our efforts have, have expanded internationally. And so uh, not only am I getting the privilege of addressing all of you uh, uh, here and those attending virtually uh, and in person for the University of Oklahoma, but uh, we are going to be next week at the uh, Geothermal Rising Conference and have about three different uh, speaking spots and panels. And I hope that many of you will be able to attend live or virtually there, there in San Diego because we have a lot of interesting uh, things to share with you. So thank you for being here today. I have uh, about 30 slides I'm going to share for the next uh, 40 or so minutes. and. Uh, I would invite you can hold your questions till the end or if there's something important that during during the, the presentation that you want to bring up, I'd also be pleased to answer questions, but we can always go back to the slides if uh, if there are questions at the end. So that will probably work best in most cases. Uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about this image you see up here first as you think about the name of this. Uh, of this presentation, the growth of geothermal energy networks and communities. You take a look at this community. This was prepared for the New York City uh, commissioners back in 2013 for a presentation that uh, uh, Bob Wyman and myself and some other people were able to give there. And it was part of a, an equation we were trying to uh, get our heads around and that was how we were going to uh, collectively get 900,000 out of the 1.1 million buildings in New York City, just one of the problems or challenges we face converted to geothermal exchange because decarbonization and building electrification is, was requiring us to be able to do that. And so we created this image and as you know, much like many communities throughout the uh, throughout the United States and the world, there are uh, waterfronts, bodies of water near there. There's certainly infrastructure under many of our populated cities. There are city centers with commercial buildings. Of course, uh, there are apartments and single family homes, everything from zoos to recreational facilities. There are wastewater treatment plants to deal with our our uh, sewers and with all of this how could all of this be pulled in together as part of a, a geothermal energy network and we're as we go through this i want you to think about what you see here and how all of these energy resources these are called energy heat sources and energy heat sinks a source means it it, it is putting off heat, it's a heat emitter, and a sink means it's a heat absorber. And we're dealing with energy in the form of, it doesn't matter how you uh, monetize energy, whether it's BTUs, kilowatts, joules, whatever, it's energy that is, is being used and reused. And that's the problem with our existing society, whether we're using combustion heating internal combustion engines or whatever, this is all part of the uh, challenge we have of not just consuming energy once and then throwing it away, rather we need to use and reuse energy. And that's the, that's the ultimate goal of sustainable energy solutions. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is we all understand that energy can neither be created nor destroyed 
But when you figure out how to use and reuse the same BTUs over and over again, then you're starting to get to the root of the solution. And so as, you, as we go through this, I want you to think about that. The creation of geothermal energy networks involves drilling infrastructure. It involves horizontal infrastructure between all of the buildings in a city or a community. And that equals a community that is able to diversify their thermal energy loads. So this is something that is going to require millions of design and construction and trades uh, and, and everything in between. And the, the, think about the uh, talent that's required. It's everything from pipe fitters to electricians, to architects, to engineers, to drillers, uh, um, to, um, to air conditioning contractors, and the list goes on. So we, we have a solution here that puts millions of people to work over the next several generations to really get our society to a point where we're, um, we're using energy, renewable energy properly. As a matter of fact, 40% of our energy is actually used for heating and cooling in hot water. And when we start piping it between our buildings, then we're really starting to use our energy properly. I mentioned some of the books we've been involved in. These uh, illustrate a couple of them, Geothermal HVAC, Green Heating and Cooling, and Modern Geothermal HVAC Engineering and Controls Act applications. We're also involved in children's education, and you can go onto our website and download children's and middle school books that are designed to educate our up and coming generations on this. And this just kind of goes over some of the uh, evolutionary um, challenges we've come over to create some really remarkable um, uh, geothermal educational assets for elementary and, and middle school and high school education. Now, let's get into the basics of a geothermal heat pump system. We are used to, in the industry, dealing with furnaces uh, or combustion heating of some sort. And what that is converting over to now is heat pumps. And there are two basic types of heat pumps. Those are air source heat pumps, like you see here with the condenser and compressor unit outside. And there are geothermal heat pumps, which are usually mounted completely inside of a building. A heat pump is an electrically powered device that does not create heat, nor does it create cool. Rather, a heat pump pumps energy that's available in the outside air or in the ground into or out of a building. It uses one unit of electricity to pump up to four units or more of heat in and out of a building. An air source heat pump does this using outside air, which is a renewable energy resource, or using the temperature in the ground, which is, is a more average temperature year round. So for example, if you were in New York, and I understand you're in Oklahoma, let's just use that. Your temperature in the ground, about six feet down, averages perhaps 60 or 62 degrees year round. And the temperature outside might get to 100 degrees in the summer and might get below freezing in the wintertime, right? You'll be snow covered. And so the air source heat pump would be battling against those temperature extremes, but still doing its job reasonably well. But the geothermal heat pump is, is tapping into that warmer energy source in the wintertime, and it's rejecting to that uh, cooler energy heat sink in the summertime. So the heat pump, which is pumping heat out of the building and into the ground, is able to do it more efficiently because the ground is 60 degrees, even when it's 100 degrees outside in the summer. And when it's below freezing in the winter, that 60 degree temperature resource is much better 
for extracting heat than the outside temperature, which might be below freezing. So that's the fundamental idea. Now, it's important before I move on to understand that these are compressor or Carnot refrigeration cycle based pieces of equipment. They have all the components of a window air conditioner, all the components of a refrigerator in them. They have a compressor, a condenser, an expansion valve, and an evaporator. That is for another class if you don't understand the Carnot refrigeration cycle and don't feel at a disadvantage if you don't. Probably 99% of the world doesn't understand how the Carnot refrigeration cycle works, but they do know that they can go to the refrigerator no matter what the temperature is outside and get ice out of the freezer and get cool sodas and water out of the refrigerator. That's using the same technology as a heat pump. A refrigerator is a heat pump that pumps heat out of the box. That's all we're gonna really talk about with regard to how it's done for today. We're gonna to go into now looking at a building, how it uses these geothermal heat pumps like you see right here. This is just one unit in a residential infrastructure or a residential home. What about a bit, what about a commercial office building like maybe the building you're, or the classroom you're sitting in now? The way a building like that is normally constructed is that it uses a bunch of, it will use a bunch of water source heat pumps that are tied together with, with what, you, what is called a condenser water loop. And it uses a cooling tower to expel the heat in the summertime. And it uses a boiler to create heat in the wintertime. With a geothermal building exactly like this, these same heat pumps, which are re represented in this hydronic schematic, use not a cooling tower and not a boiler. These are eliminated and replaced with a geothermal exchanger, which I realize is kind of behind my head here. So I'll move to the side and you can kind of see it there. And, and that geothermal exchanger or geothermal infrastructure is used to replace your combustion boiler and it's used to replace your cooling tower. All that energy, instead of being exchanged with outside air, is exchanged with the ground. When you get into a bigger application, you're going to involve all of your commercial buildings, your residential school buildings, and everything on what's called a district geothermal energy network. And you can kind of see this here. And if you look at the little arrows here, you can see that your commercial buildings are always heat emitters. They are rejecting heat even during the coldest times of the winter. And why do you think that is? That is because internal gains in a commercial building are such that all of our body heat, all of our computers, all of our lights that are in commercial buildings, which are normally very tight, are creating more heat than the building needs to be heated. So even if you don't know this, it's important you understand it now, commercial buildings <clears throat> are cooling dominant, even in the coldest of climates, while our residential buildings and smaller commercial buildings will need heat. In other words, they're heating dominant in the winter time. So the really big story in this is that what, during the winter, when our residential customers and our apartment customers, uh, citizens, are paying, while we're used to paying a tremendous amount for natural gas or electricity or propane to heat our buildings in the winter time, that's not necessary. While we're paying $100 or $200 or $300 a month to heat our buildings, our homes, and our apartments during the wintertime, our commercial buildings are expelling tremendous amounts of heat through their cooling towers. When we tie into a ge geothermal energy network where we tie our buildings together, our 
our commercial processing plants, our commercial office buildings, our heat emitters, and look at your residential buildings, they are absorbing this heat during the winter. So with a geothermal energy network, we end up having no more outdoor equipment. In other words, we've eliminated our cooling towers and our outside condensers, which makes our buildings longer lasting, longevity, as you see here. They're more hurricane and storm resilient because there's no more equipment outside. We've eliminated our combustion boilers and cooling towers and furnaces, which is key to decarbonization and building electrical electrification. We have noticeably superior comfort in both heating and cooling modes because of the even temperature of the geothermal energy network instead of the extreme temperature of the outdoor air. And we have remarkable system efficiency at standard equipment pricing. In other words, this heat pump here costs about the same as this heat pump here. The only difference in cost is the first installation of the geothermal resource or the energy network. But if you think about it, don't we have millions of miles of natural gas pipeline in our infrastructure right now? Don't we have millions of miles of electrical infrastructure now? That is all going to be replaced with geothermal energy networks, which will handle about 40% of our energy exchange for our buildings. And these will be, um, these energy networks will be monetized by geothermal energy utilities, which are probably going to be very common household names, such as PSEG, Con Ed, Southern California Edison, Whatever the utility is you're paying energy bills to now will probably be similar uh, to the energy utility you'll be paying um, for thermal energy uh, from the thermal energy network. And it will be much less. Remember how I said you use one unit of energy to move four or five units of heat. This means it will be a much more energy efficient network and it will. Um, it will cost you less and save everybody a significant amount of money. These geothermal and energy networks will create millions of jobs as they go in into our cities and into our communities nationwide and worldwide. What, they, what we don't realize that is happening with air source heat pumps, which are a fine technology, except that they have these outdoor condensers which are simply going to waste away and become eyesores to the buildings, and they don't help what's called our, our uh, peak energy demand. They actually cause um, energy peaking because of the extreme cold during the winter time and the extreme heat during the summertime. So as you can see where they kind of can look handsome in certain situations, you really don't want these in weather events all over the top of a building. And this is after a weather event, after a storm where these pieces of equipment have been blown all about the roof. And you don't really want the storefronts and sides of buildings littered or the tops of buildings littered with all of this um, outside air conditioning equipment when it can be all indoors, such as you saw in this case right here, and in this case right here, where you get rid of the outside equipment. So jumping back, plumbing, uh, th this will be a, a fundamentally hydronic technology and is, and many of these have been installed, these energy networks currently, and many of them are going in currently. And it's a fundamentally hydronic, meaning water-based uh, water infrastructure. And a good example of this is the Cornell campus in Ithaca, New York. They use, and this is, uh, just, this is just an example, it can be done many different ways. They are using currently Lake Cayuga 
to do all of the cooling, in other words, air conditioning for their entire campus because Lake Cayuga is about 40 degrees at the base of the lake. If they had a warmer resource, such as maybe lakes in Oklahoma or even in Florida, they would use that resource in addition to heat pumps to get it cooled down the rest of the way. In the case of Ithaca, Cornell Ithaca, they're currently preparing to drill a deep direct use well, which will handle the heating needs for the campus. And what heating needs they need on top of that will be handled with, um, with heat pumps, large, large um, central plant heat pumps. So as you can see in Cornell's case, water cools, the earth heats. Either way, both of these are geothermal energy exchange technologies that are doing this whole campus, the entire Cornell campus, off of a central energy loop that is geothermal sourced. Another example of something going in currently is the, uh, is the Penn South, or being engineered currently, is the Penn South uh, um, Cooperative Apartment Complex in Manhattan. A series of 15 22-story buildings that are that are currently um, heated using what's com called combined heat and power source and combustion boilers to provide their heating in the winter. In the summertime, they're cooled using on-site electrical generation and central energy plant chillers. The way that they will be heated and cooled will be all off of geothermal energy exchange. And since these are primarily residential apartments, 2,800 families live here, um, we're going to tie in some of the commercial buildings such as Penn Station, uh, uh, other um, schools that are around here, other public buildings that are around here, such as the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. We're going to invite all of these folks to become heat emitters, which will provide heat sources that will end up providing summer energy that these apartments can use uh, for heating in the uh, wintertime. And then in the summertime, they will tie into an energy network will, which will expand heat to a geothermal heat sink, such as the Hudson River or the East River or even into the MTA um, system, which is being dewatered at the rate of about, uh, at the rate of millions of gallons per minute throughout the island of Manhattan. What these look like, and just to give you an idea of some of the central infrastructure that can be tied in, um, if you look at this image down here, you can see that a central energy network, a thermal energy network, will tie in to uh, the wastewater thermal exchange. One of the things we tend to not think about is all of the um, water that goes down our drains. If you think about that, when we're showering or we're washing dishes or we're washing clothes or, uh, or anything, even flushing our, our toilets, what we have is an incredible heat source of much of the time preheated water that's going down the drain. The U.S. Department of Energy estimates that about 300, and this is from 10 years ago, there are new figures coming out, but about 350 billion kilowatt hours of energy in the United States alone go down the, uh, the drain. It's all energy that we've paid to heat in the form of water heating and even if you think about just the energy in our pipes and our toilet tanks, during the middle of the winter, that, though, that water comes in at 50 degrees into our homes and buildings. And once it gets into our pipes, that water is warmed up because of BTUs that we use to heat our buildings to room temperature. So by the time it goes down the drain, it's always between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit which is an incredible amount of, of energy that is now being tapped at wastewater plant level energy recovery operations. And there are several of these installed internationally at the wastewater plant level and several installed 
at the building and infrastructure level. So as you see this wastewater thermal exchange down here, it's part of the infrastructure that's going to be tied in to our thermal energy networks uh, as our cities uh, develop um, in the new uh, decarbonized and beneficial electrification mode of development. In addition to that, I'm sure that everybody on this uh, conference has heard uh, that data centers are going in at a breakneck pace right now. Our data needs are extraordinary. So these hyperscale data centers are going in faster than we can even keep track of them. For Facebook, for Amazon, for Intel, you just name, for Microsoft, just, just name any number of major corporations and they're putting these in faster than we can keep track of. These have, have so much uh, energy to be expended for our communities that there is no reason to ever pay, as we develop this, there's no excuse to ever pay for one more or to expend one more uh, therm of combustion energy because of the waste energy available. We're involved in a project right now in Wyoming, a hyperscale um, data center project that is uh, rated at about 120 megawatts of energy, which is the equivalent of 40,000 tons of heat rejection, uh, which is enough to basically cool a small city center, uh, cool and heat a small city center in equivalent uh, energy, such as I'm talking about a small city center, such as downtown Tampa, such as, uh, downtown, uh, you know, think of your small city centers, a larger city center, such as Toronto or something like that, Toronto, Canada, um, would be more like 300,000 tons, just to give you an idea uh, of the uh, capacities. So there are just an incredible amount of opportunities. And as we develop these communities, we're developing infrastructure that goes into the streets at the same time as we're doing other upgrades. What do you think the infrastructure for our water pipes is in most of our cities right now? It's usually some type of steel infrastructure and so is our wastewater pipe. It's usually some type of steel infrastructure that has a limited lifetime. These, and you've heard about the, um, the US infrastructure plan, that is mostly for wastewater and water resources to get our water resources, uh, uh, in, in other words, our water infrastructure built up to where it's safe again. And that involves repiping our downtown communities. And so as we do those, the, that new piping, as you can see here, this is not steel piping. This is high density polyethylene and cross leak polyethylene piping that's going in for this. And what do you think the average life expectancy of polyethylene is in the ground? It's not 100 years. It's more like 300 years life expectancy. As this pipeline, these pipelines are going in, this, at the same time, we can put in the infrastructure for geothermal energy networks. It's just another, basically, what looks like a water pipe that's going into the ground. And it's usually about the same size as a water main or about the same size as a natural gas main. And so we can do this infrastructure at the same time as we're upgrading our cities anyway. So it becomes part of the national infrastructure plan. And when we do these, the sources, and I know you probably can't read that, the sources for this infrastructure, I'm gonna read it to you, are, are not only supply and injection wells for geothermal resources, but it's also surface water exchange. It's also water treatment facilities. It's wastewater treatment facilities. It's, it, in addition to that, it's uh, dewatering efforts, such as have to be done for our subways and low-lying and basement areas. All of this can be tied into this central geothermal energy network infrastructure and become part of the energy exchange that we end up using 
for our um, for our systems. And this is how that looks in a city block type arrangement. I'll move over to the side here and you can kind of see that the this is tower one, tower two, a rehabilitation or a home, a private housing, a public school. All of these buildings are tied into a central energy exchange facility or a pump house that ties into uh, infrastructure resources such as domestic water supply, dewatering operations, subways, basements, et cetera, that is able to exchange heat with this central energy infrastructure. Also, when we're doing this, uh, when, whenever we're doing a building, something we haven't talked about, but something we saw in an earlier image, if you remember it, was sometimes we, as the buildings are constructed, they have to sit on these energy pilings, and these energy pilings support the building so that it stays uh, flat and square. They usually go down to bedrock or some type of substantial um, substantial support infrastructure under the ground or support structure under the ground. And these energy, this is the beauty of thinking outside the box. Did you know that most, most of the buildings constructed, even high rise buildings can get most of their heat exchange, if not all of it from just combining the support columns with energy exchange. And these are now called energy piles. Energy piles are support columns that are also energy exchange columns. And this is how it looks as before the pipes are tied into a central energy exchange uh, exchanger that, that exchanges energy with central heat pumps. And this is kind of what it looks like going in under a recent construction project in New York City that is being um, being engineered by uh, GI Energy, which is now under a new parent company, Shell. Um, so once again, we have these energy networks such as Cornell, and this is the Cornell Ithaca campus. Did you know that on Roosevelt Island in New York City, Cornell's uh, Bloomberg campus is also a geothermal sourced system. This is the geothermal energy field that exchanges heat with this entire building and provides all of the heating and cooling exchange needed for that building. We recently um, <clears throat> were working with the Empire State Plaza in Albany, New York. The Empire State Plaza is pictured here and was a project uh, initiated by Governor Rockefeller, Rockefeller in the 60s, which, um, which ended up becoming the nation's largest and, and uh, most expensive, um, most expensive uh, state capital project. And as you can see, it's very expansive. It involves these five towers, plus all of these buildings around here. This um, plaza is one uh, was 100% combustion sourced heating and cooling. In other words, these chillers were powered by high energy steam, which was created at the energy plant with this huge bank of combustion, natural gas combustion boilers, uh, a couple of miles away from the plaza in Sheridan Hollow. And these, and these massive chillers were driven by high energy steam. And as they were planning another um, energy upgrade project that would put the uh, entire plaza under a combined heat and power, um, combined heat and power plant, um, Egg Geothermal got involved together with many other um, import, uh, very, um, very uh, involved entities, and we started challenging the idea of putting a CHP plant when we're trying to decarbonize our state, our states, our country, and the world. And so this $100 million CHP project um, hit the news 
we uh, do a lot of writing and uh, do a lot of uh, efforts toward decarbonizing the world. So we published this article in Renewable Energy World, which kind of exposed that geothermal heating and cooling was a solution that should be looked at instead of this $88 million combined heating and cooling plant. As a matter of fact, we stated in the article that this $88 million investment would become a stranded asset. Do you know what a stranded asset is? That probably explains itself. It's an asset that you put in that will be absolute, that will be illegal or wasted because it will not be used to the full extent of its life. And by New York's own state's state laws, what's called the CLCPA, it would have become illegal within about 10 years because of emissions reductions. So we brought this to light and we were able to get the entire campus, um, the entire CHP project reversed. Those funds were put into decarbonizing and now they are purchasing electrical chillers and putting them back onto the electrical grid versus going with more combustion sourced high energy steam chillers. Remember, if we are going with electric driven devices, we are getting onto an electrical energy grid that has a growing proportion of renewable energy sources on that grid, such as solar energy, wind energy, hydropower, and other things. The way this is done is through educational modules. We educate people uh, through our textbook and trades curriculum and using case studies and real world examples, such as you can see here in these efforts for the Amalgamated Housing Corporation, which is a, a large cooperative campus in the Bronx, New York Institute of Technology, which is a campus in, in Long Island, through this Penn South campus, which is currently going on in uh, Manhattan and, uh, and other projects just like this. And we have these projects actually going on throughout the world, but this, this uh, presentation was prepared primarily for domestic, uh, domestic considerations. So the types of geothermal exchange networks, as we come full circle on this, that we're looking for involve heating, uh, providing all of the heating and cooling source and sink energy for our homes, hospitals, buildings, and schools from multiple resources. And to give you an idea of these multiple resources, this is kind of a, an idea of all of the different sources and sinks that can be used. And in, if we had, um, well, we, we've done it in textbooks and we're currently engaged in a, another textbook, which is probably going to be a couple of years to come out on geothermal energy networks. You couldn't cover it in, in 500 pages or, or, or a year. That's why studies are such as what you're doing right now at, at, um, at the university. But there are so many opportunities for this that we, that we need to engage bright young minds, such as the students at the University of Oklahoma, at uh, organizations such as Geothermal Rising and their conference to fully understand and use your bright minds to help challenge the old way of thinking and get us into a completely renewable and sustainable network, such as you see here. And that is the end of my presentation. So, Cesar, you can open it up however you wish, and I'll stop sharing so that you can, we can actually see each other a little bit better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Very nice presentation now. Eh, eh, okay.
You've got a blur in the background, so I can see you, but I can't see your class. Yes, it's... But that's okay. Uh, well, no, yeah. maybe everybody yeah. wants to see the class. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no. The, the people, you know, can can come, come here and uh, and ask your questions. So okay, you we are no, we're open for questions now. So any question from from the audience? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hi, good. Thank you for uh, <laughs> coming over. It's Lori in the back. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was amazing. Thank you, Very Lori. entertaining. Uh -huh. So I have a question um, regarding the capacity that a single well has to produce uh, energy. So how many wells will, will, should we need, you know, for let's say one of the examples that you provided? The University yeah. of Cornell. So, how are they doing? You know, like how many, how many wells would uh, a university need? You know, in order to supply their demand, their energy. That is, that is such a wonderful and enlightening question. And the answer to that is that it really varies um, quite dramatically. Uh, so, if you think about Ball State University converted their entire campus uh, to a geothermal exchange. Now, in their case, they did um, what they did six inch diameter wells about 500 feet deep, and they did thousands of those to handle the multi thousand ton load for Ball State University. Uh, and, and because those were smaller capacity closed loop wells, where Cornell is doing one very deep and large capacity thermal well, which they're going down several kilometers, where if you think about the Ball State example, uh, they are only going down 500 feet and getting low grade heat. The uh, Cornell campus, and other deep geothermal assets like them go down several kilometers. So where the heat availability in a low temperature or a shallow well is maybe 55, 60 degrees, somewhere in there, the deep multi-kilometer deep wells will be able to access 300 degree plus uh, thermal assets. And that is deep, that's called deep direct use when you're able to use the energy directly for heating. And if you go a little bit deep, just, just so I take it a little further, if you go uh, a little bit deeper and you're able to do a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a well doublet and pump water down one well and it, it communicates with the other well, as they call this enhanced geothermal and puts steam out the other, the other well, the other well then you can use that steam to drive turbines, and that's called enhanced geothermal or geothermal electric facilities. Really, it's all part of the same wonderful technology, but what we do is, as you just crystallized with your wonderful question, where, um, where Ball State University and several others are, are the same, but I use that because that was one I followed very closely, they had literally, I wish I had an image to show, uh, show you presently, but they literally had to do thousands of small wells where Cornell was able to do, is, is able to do one larger deep well. So it depends on the application. Now, however, Cornell's deep well costs tens of millions of dollars, perhaps, and the other wells Yes, they cost tens of millions of dollars, but it's 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 at the rate of only a few thousand dollars per shallow well. You get what I'm saying? Yes, and actually, I was going to to ask you that question, so you reply that in advance. Good. <laughs> so, I'm glad. Yeah, like how cost effective that will be, and yeah, basically how risky because with yes. one well maybe it's more expensive, but the risk will be reduced yes. in the area. Thank you yeah. so much for your answer. Well, you're welcome. And thank you so much for your uh, thoughtful question. I loved that question. Thank you. Okay.
<clears throat> okay, I I have a I have a question myself, and okay. it's related to the you know related to the distance because uh, when you are uh, when you want to heat and cool a, a building, but the building is surrounded by other buildings, so you need to look into a place for drill the wells. So what uh, what is the best way to to do this, and what you know how what is the longest distance that can be acceptable for this kind of project? I mean, the longest distance from the from the building itself to the to the wells. That is such a good question. I really want to give you a gold star for asking that because uh, just to restate your question, Cesar, it was what is the you know. You asked about drilling, you know, in the proximity of a space and and how deep or whatever might and how, what the limitations might be versus how far away. I'm going to cover the first one first. Um, there's a company called Dandelion and many other companies do this in New York State that has got this down. And anybody that's in the geothermal industry can understand if you have just a few square feet in the front yard or in the sidewalk area of a, of a building, they can usually put a well down that will handle most of the capacity of that building on a single building exchange need. Uh, so it, there is really very little in the way of limitations as far as area. If you have a sidewalk in front of your building, uh, a good example of this is St. Patrick's Cathedral, and there are many hundreds of, of examples like that, but they're in, they're in Manhattan. They had no green space to drill. So what they did is they closed down the sidewalks and the streets for a period of time down both sides of the block they were on, and they drilled in the sidewalk area, put the wells in, and then re established the sidewalks after they were done and they were able and they did this in about 2016 those wells were 2200 feet deep and they were what are called standing column wells so that made financial sense for saint patrick's cathedral a very old and established church in manhattan so that is one example now i want to go to the other one you talked about that involves how far would it make sense to drill a, a, to run a pipeline to an energy source? And I would ask, before I answer that, I want to ask for, um, for, for our American public and for the utilities that we use now, how far did it make sense to pipe energy in the form of fossil fuels for piping it into um, our refineries and so forth. And how far did it make sense to pipe natural gas? In the first case, I remember from when I was a young man in the 60s and 70s, the Alaska pipeline became a reality and they piped that, uh, that crude oil um, thousands of miles to refineries and that made sense. So that's an energy resource where they pipe a petroleum project. If you think about natural gas, those pipelines run clear across the entire states to the tune of millions of miles of distribution lines. There is no difference in the piping of natural gas resources as compared to geothermal energy networks. It is exactly the same thing. We're piping energy, except what's the big difference? Geothermal energy networks or geothermal energy sources are renewable and sustainable and are not involved in combustion heating. So uh, I would point out that some of our best resources for geothermal exchange are surface bodies of water, such as the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, Lake Ontario, whatever the surface bodies of water. And we find if you look at it, even in Las Vegas and in California, we have surface bodies of water and lakes within a few hundred miles, if not just a few miles of everybody. And these are some of, just as you saw with uh, Cornell, that provides all of the cooling 
and uh, needed for the campus and a geothermal surface water exchange resource without even drilling any wells can provide uh, all of the energy exchange needed for entire city centers. It's interesting to note that Toronto, downtown Toronto is cooled from Lake Ontario, which hasn't nearly been tapped to, to the maximum capacity. We could do all, probably most of New York from the, uh, just the Great Lakes that are around New York. And then you consider Michigan and the other, uh, and the other um, states that surround it. We could do an incredible amount of heat transfer just from surface water. And when we don't have surface water, we can drill into the ground and pipe those resources in, even if it's many miles, when you consider how far we've, we've, uh, we've considered it worthwhile to pump, to pipe natural gas and oil resources. So the answer is kind of a mystery. What's the maximum length that we can pipe these energy resources that are renewable? I would argue there's no maximum we go to where the most reasonable source of energy exchange is and we pipe it in because it's a renewable energy resource. And what we do, I'm not meaning to just, to just slough off your question, that's where um, scoping studies and, uh, and, and feasibility studies come into play because when a city center such as Boston, Albany, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, you know, uh, wherever, um, wherever we want to look at a study for a downtown, we would look at all the energy resources and do a study and determine this is the best place to get energy source and sink for that area and, and provide a scoping study that provides the, the, um, the, the financial analysis that confirms whether local or more distant resources are better for those uh, energy exchange resources. That's a long answer, I know, but I'm very passionate about it. And we've proved it over and over again in our studies that you can go many, many miles away for those energy exchange resources, Cesar. Oh, we, oh, we really thank you know, for, for that long and you know, very nice explanation. So, I am curious is about, uh, in that case, how to deal with the, uh, the temperature, temperature exchange. For instance, if we want to maintain, you know, the, we are producing hot water, you know, if you have a long pipeline, probably you can to deal with the temperature losses. So in that case, how to deal with that, especially That's for a long distance project? That, that's a great question, and I'll re that, that is worth resharing my screen for, which I'm going to do right now, uh, if I did this right. Hold on, new window. There we go. So in, in, in that, if you look at this, this is not a high temperature or a low temperature resource here. Um, this is a, actually a, is it sharing, by the way? Did I share it? No, no. Okay, let me do it again. I'm sorry. Try it again. Now is it sharing? Uh, yes. Yes. So this is what's called an ambient temperature resource. This is using the temperature of the earth in this area. What we were talking about with Cornell, for example, and I'm just, I hope, I, there it is. They use dual temperature resources. They're using a hot temperature resource and they're using a cold temperature resource. In their case, they're using water to cool the campus because this Cayuga Lake is 42 degrees year round and it provides all the chilled water they need. And in this case, this is hopefully going to be 300 degrees or at least 200 degrees year round and will provide all of the heating where in another in this other example right here, such as this campus, but you can't see it. In this, in this example right here, this is an ambient temperature resource where the temperature uh, is the same as the ground. So when you're talking about something like that, this pipeline, the, the, the application I'm talking about would be um, would be able to go a long way away from the center of the uh, of the resource 
uh, because the temperature of the ground is, is exactly what you want this ambient resource to be because that is exactly what your heat pumps inside of the, inside of the uh, individual buildings are using. They're using that temperature as an, as an exchange temperature. So it is a little complex because we have to determine if we're using a hot resource, a cold resource, or an ambient resource. And that's part of our, our, uh, our scoping and feasibility studies on these. So you're right, if it was a hot resource, I would not want to run that many, many miles necessarily. I would want to use that at a local energy plant to create electricity, for example. But if it's an ambient resource, that can be run uh, many, many miles in from a surface water aquifer or other type of geothermal exchange facility to give that uh, heat source and heat sink capability. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Hello. Okay, so I was just um, thinking um, for um, the vertical um, closed loop geothermal system. I was thinking that probably maybe the uh, maybe the depth of this vertical closed loop system is uh, maybe in a way hindered by the depth of the groundwater system in the area where they're going to be constructed. So I don't know. I was going to ask like maybe what like the deepest possible uh, vertical closed loop system that maybe has been constructed. You're wondering if it's possible with a closed loop system to finish the sentence. I didn't hear the rest of it. I said uh, maybe what is the what is like the maybe the deepest uh, very close vertical closed loop system that has been constructed. I don't. I, I, I want to have maybe an idea of that because I was thinking that maybe for the vertical closed loop system, they may be the depth of the piping may be hindered by the uh, maybe the depth of the groundwater system in the area. Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, you're saying do you want to keep that above the groundwater? Um, actually, with a vertical closed loop system, um, it's wonderful, and this is part of the, um, the shortness of our course today, it doesn't get into it. Many, many vertical closed loop systems go completely through groundwater aquifers. What we didn't get a chance to do because we didn't get into the design is talk about how those closed loop systems, we have to seal and grout those boreholes to keep the aquifer safe. So what happens, and you can kind of, uh, and it, it's for another course, but if you were to go through a course, we kind of seal those boreholes, kind of like as you saw in the example of, uh, of the stand, of the, um, of the uh, energy, um, the um, energy piles. They're filled with concrete, they're sealed. So uh, it doesn't, it, it's actually helpful to go through aquifers and so forth. And many times, almost in any place in the US and anywhere else, you'll hit an aquifer within a couple hundred feet. So aquifers, because of the advective flow of water, it tends to be, uh, the more we hit aquifers, the better the heat transfer is. Uh, just so, for example, if you're in solid bedrock, like much of the country is also, even in that situation, bedrock, granite is a great heat conductor, but you will still have fractures in there where groundwater is passing through and will, will cause uh, excellent heat transfer. It sounds like you're involved in geology, otherwise you wouldn't be asking this question, right? Yes, I'm a geoscientist. I knew it, I knew it. Yeah, that's the first thing you think of. And as a matter of fact, one of our prime, <clears throat> our prime uh, consulting and advocacy agreements is with a major government geophysical uh, engineering firm in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is using this technology to use what they know as geophysicists to, to develop the uh, geothermal exchange market in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So we work with them four or five hours a week on developing this technology. And they're, they're actually developing entire communities that are exchanging heat, just like we've talked about here with the, uh, with the um, desert there uh, for, as a heat sink. Thank you so much. Thank you.
What a wonderful group we've had today, Cesar. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, yes. Please, Laura. I'm so pleased to see everybody um, is keeping uh, keeping their masks on today. I know that's very important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, uh, my question, thank you so much for your talk first. Uh, sure. My question is a little bit more general. It's like uh, when you're doing your threat assessment of an area, what are like the main variables you take into account to define well, certain areas, like in general? That is a wonderful question. And uh, I, there are six major <clears throat> variables we take into account when we do an assessment. And so that I don't, um, so that I don't misspeak, I'm gonna actually pull up one of our assessments and uh, <clears throat> read that off very quickly. So bear with me just one second uh, while I pull that up. It'll take just about 15 seconds. That's an excellent question and it deserves an excellent answer. I just want you to know that. And so you're going to get one. Okay. And almost there, I'm getting ready to open it. All right. So when we do this, the first thing we do, there are six points. <clears throat> we identify the surface, ground, groundwater, wastewater, and cooling potential resources on the site. So we look at all those potential resources for heat transfer. Then we, number two, we narrow the focus of the application systems that might be able to be used on the site. In other words, what buildings can we handle with on-site energy resources? Then three, we develop a preliminary plan to deploy a site geothermal exchange distribution system. And sometimes, to answer your question, if we need to pull in outside resources off of the property, that's already identified. So then after we identify that, we develop a plan to deploy site the geothermal exchange uh, distribution system, that's three. Then four, very important for the bean counters. You know what a bean counter is? That's your accountants, right? We address the economic impact to the campus or site of installing a geothermal heat exchange system. Because what do they want to know? They want to know how much it costs and when they're going to get their money back in energy savings or, or from rebates or, or, or other things. Then five is we develop what's called a commentary as to considerations to geothermal exchange at this site. In other words, that's our narrative. That's where we, we put uh, probably 20 pages of all of the positives, all of the negatives, so that everybody that's reviewing this goes, okay, okay, that's plain English. And then six, we produce a high level geothermal feasibility report with all of the necessary appendices and attachments. And that will be between 50 and 200 pages long by the time they get it. And it usually costs somewhere between 250,000 and a million dollars to do a large campus feasibility study. And we will spend sometimes thousands of hours on it. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. You have a okay. wonderful group of students, Cesar. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I think that there are no much more uh, questions. So, uh, what I, you know, so thank you so much, Mr. Egg. You know, that was a wonderful conference. You know, everybody enjoys and we learn a lot of this. Uh, you know, I want to know if we are, if we can, you know, if we have any further questions, you know, can we contact you? Uh, you bet you can. You can email me. You have my email. I would love to do this again when you have another opportunity. I would like to know also how many of, uh, of your students are um, attending either virtually or live 
as uh, or how many of your team over there to the GRC conference that's happening next week and the week after in San Diego. I know you're part of the student team for the geothermal, geothermal rising uh, group. Yeah, so we are, uh, at least we are, we are two students and, and, our, uh, and our advisor, Dr. Salehi. So we are going to be three, so hopefully we can meet there and, you know, and talk a little bit more about this thing that, you know, is so interested and for, uh, for, as well for us. Well, good. We have a panel on Wednesday morning. I'm doing a talk on Tuesday, plus I'm doing a workshop talk on Saturday. But on Tuesday, it's either the third or fourth, or no, no, it's Wednesday the fifth. There's a panel which includes a, a high-level member of the Department of Energy. Low-temperature geothermal resources will be there. The director of New York State's Energy Resource Energy uh, Resources for Clean Heating and Cooling will be there. The Saudi Arabian, um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia a representative will be there, and uh, we will have. Um, uh, also, a member of Baker Hughes Global Geothermal will be there, and uh, as well as myself. And we're going to address a, in a two-hour panel a lot of the things we talked about today. So I hope that you are able to attend that on Wednesday morning at 7:30 Eastern. And uh, we'll have several members of the Eight Geo team at the conference also. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, we are going to we are going to find time and you know of course we are going to to see that 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 that, whole, that panel so yeah thank you so much and you know uh, have a great afternoon thank you so you much too. for sharing your your knowledge with us and send a be sure and send along this video so that uh we can uh put it in our archives too thank you cesar and thank you everybody wonderful wonderful group thank you okay thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. Okay.